Inside the Illini Big Ten College Football is brought to you by your local Anheuser-Busch distributors, O'Brien Auto Park of Urbana, Hickory River Smokehouse in Urbana, and WAND. Welcome to a brand new season of Inside the Illini Big Ten Football, the show that takes you inside the Illini football program, the interview rooms, the practices, and gets you ready for this week's game. Hi, I'm Matt Loveless, coming to you with a new season of the show at a new location, Hickory River Smokehouse in Urbana. I'll tell you what, it smells like barbecue sauce the whole time, and that's exactly how a football pregame show should be. Now, if you watched last year, you know that we go way in depth of the Illini football program. We'll take a look at last week's game, in this case, last season. Plus, we'll take a look at this week's game, which in this case is Southern Illinois. Excited to get the football season started. And one of my favorite parts of this show is it's about football. And we compile some of the best minds in Illini football every year to do just that. And joining me at the table once again is Steve Kelly, Sports Talk 1400. Been around for a little while. I won't say how many years, Steve. Well, 30-something. 30 30-something. 30 Covering Illinois football. I've enjoyed it and uh, anxious to get another season underway. And then Matt Daniels, uh, Champagne News Gazette beat writer. Your first year on the beat, but I'll tell you what, nobody's been at more practices and interview rooms than this guy right uh, here. I, I feel weird if I'm not at a practice. Uh, I'm looking forward to the, uh, the season, seeing what the Illini can do, and I uh, know a lot of fans are as well. I know expectations, guys, aren't high this year. Uh, that's because of last year. We shake our heads and we joke a lot behind the scenes, uh, but we have seen camp so far this year. Let's just start off the show with what we've seen this year. Maybe reasons for optimism, 2013. Well, they haven't lost a game yet, so that's that's good. Um, they got a Nathan Shields back at quarterback, a four-year starter, and they got uh, some other you know proven players, some veterans at the wide receiver core. Uh, defense is looking strong at linebacker with Jonathan Brown and Mason Monheim back. And uh, secondary is looking a little green, but Ernest Thomas has uh, kind of stepped into that leadership role that they need. And uh, the, the, the big message that Tim Beckman had this whole entire offseason and throughout camp has just been positivity and just, you know, forgetting last year and, and moving ahead and moving forward. So we'll see what, what transpires with that. I think the uh, big story of the offseason is the hiring of offensive coordinator Bill Cubitt. I think uh, that will improve the offense. And, and watching uh, practice both in Champaign and at Rantoul, I, I think it looks a little more organized and like they've got a better plan this year. We'll wait and see when the games actually start. But I think Cubitt, former head coach at Western Michigan, is a key addition to the staff. Uh, you don't have the co-coordinators anymore, and, and I think he gives them good direction there. I think the good thing is that not having the co-coordinators hiring Cube, it was a little bit of an admission, well they won't say it outright, but an admission that how things were done last year didn't really work. So to me that's a big positive of this team. At least we're changing things and I definitely like, like what Cubit's doing out on the field. He's a little bit more fiery. I don't seem to remember Chris Beatty or Billy Gonzalez hearing their voices too often during practice. You hear Bill Cubit's all the time, which yeah. is a great thing. Yeah, Bill Cubitt's very laid back off the field, very easy going, mm -hmm. can spin a story or two very well. He's very right. coaching veteran, but uh, on the field, he gets fired up out there. If, if they don't right. run routes right, or if they don't execute plays the way he wants to, he uh, he definitely lets them know about it. I, I would, If I was a player, I would not want to make Bill Cubitt mad at all. All right, guys, well, we'll talk about the season coming up here a bunch later in the show. And uh, coming up next, normally we'll take a look back at last week's game, but in this case, we'll take a look back at last season. What went wrong in 2012? Maybe a couple things that went right. We'll show you and we'll discuss next on Inside the Illini, Big Ten Football. Hi folks, welcome back to Inside the Illini here at Hickory River Smokehouse in Urbana. Talking about 2012, now going into the year it was a little hard to know what to expect for the Illini. Coming off what was really a strange year in 2011, but I don't think anybody really expected what we got as we look back at 2012. So much new in 2012. New head coach, new coordinators, but just the right amount was the same. A quarterback returning for his third year as a starter, NFL talent on defense. We have very high expectations. We're excited about that. But who was Tim Beckman? Could that high-powered Toledo offense translate? We got our first look against his former MAC opponent, Western Michigan. It was a 10-point game in the fourth quarter. The Illini needed a 60-yard interception return for a touchdown. But they won 24-7. The bad news, Nathan Shieldhouse went down with an ankle injury He'd missed two and a half games. The next week, the Illini got thumped in Tempe. 
by an above average Arizona State. They really needed week three against Charleston Southern. An FCS team on a 14 game losing streak dating back to 2010. What a day it was for backup QB Riley O'Toole. He set a school record for completion percentage. 83% of his passes, 333 yards, five touchdowns, a 44 nothing win. That was something we talked about all week. You know, we wanted to bounce back, you know, from our um, terrible performance last week and, you know, we wanted to pitch a shutout. Closing out the non conference schedule against a fast paced Louisiana. Indiana Tech team too fast for the Illini. Down 21-7 after a quarter, the Illini were overmatched. I haven't been through many defeats like this one or, or the one prior to. Our goal to, to, to go to and to win the Big Ten Championship is right out in front of us. It was the beginning of a blur of bad football. Penn State exacted revenge on Illinois for recruiting one of their players. You know, you just hurt for these seniors, you know, because that's the last time they'll get an opportunity um, to face Penn State. The problems went beyond X's and O's in Madison. Beckman caught chewing tobacco on the sidelines as the Illini dipped to two and four. I apologize, it's a terrible habit. It will be adjusted and it will not happen again. The word snowball effect became popular in Ann Arbor. Shieldhouse went down again after aggravating his injury. We saw turnovers, short fields for Michigan, and in the span of 11 minutes in the third quarter, Michigan scored three touchdowns. I'm at a loss for words. I don't really understand, you know, why we're playing the way that we're playing. The frustration hit a fever pitch two weeks later, off a of bye week on homecoming against an Indiana team that hadn't won a Big Ten game in two years. The Hoosiers waltzed out of Champaign-Urbana with a two-touchdown victory. Honestly? Okay, but I mean, you keep mentioning I lost 22 pounds. Yeah. You think I like losing? I haven't been around it. That just made the next week's game at Ohio State and the rest of them, for that matter, an inevitability. A two and seven, the Illini will not be playing in the postseason. Opportunities squandered in the final two home games, losses against struggling Minnesota and Purdue teams. It's frustrating. And on the last day of the season in Evanston, the losing streak hit nine games. The Big Ten streak pushed to 14. The season couldn't end fast enough. Every one of our coaches will be evaluated. Every one of our coordinators will evaluate our, our offensive coaches um, and vice versa. Well, guys, as we saw there, they were going to evaluate everything. Coach Beckman, after the Northwestern game, said from our coaching staff to ourselves to our, our workouts and everything. I guess in simplest terms, what went wrong last year? Well, the, I think the biggest thing was just the offense. Uh, they didn't really have any playmakers stand out. I think the co-coordinator co core, co 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 role. It's hard to say. It is hard to say. Uh, That's with, why you shouldn't Chris, have it. <laughs> with Chris Beatty and, and Billy <laughs> Gonzalez, uh, didn't really mesh well with that. Um, Nathan Shieldhouse injuries at the start of the year kind of hurt the quarterback spot. Mm -hmm. The offensive line uh, reshuffling that they had to do throughout all of last year was a, a major sore point. And, I think the players, you know, they've talked about it a lot this offseason is just buying into the, the program, buying into the system. I think last year there was some issues among the players and right. maybe more kind of looking out for themselves instead of the whole team as a whole. Well, you had a lot of guys, NFL prospects, probably hoping, seeing at some point in the season that what was going to be important was that they make sure they build their draft stock a little bit. And, I mean, you can call that selfish, but you can also call that smart for some of those guys at that point in the season when it was kind of lost, Steve. Well, Mac picked uh, the offense as the problem. I'll go with the defense <laughs> as the problem. They, uh, they weren't... Uh, no wrong answer. <laughs> they, they weren't uh, in many games. There were a lot of yeah. blowouts, uh, especially uh, midway through the season. Once you got into the Big Ten season, and of course, the Big Ten uh, losing streak now at 14 games. Yeah. hate to keep focusing on the negative all the time, right. but that's going to be talked about until they stop it. Right. And uh, we won't worry about the Big Ten schedule for a while yet. Uh, don't want to get Nebraska here too soon, but right. uh, uh, that they open at Nebraska in the Big Ten. So defense was an issue. Offense obviously was. When you go two and ten, there's a lot of uh, ways you could point the finger on what went wrong and have plenty of material to try to, to fix for the uh, 2013 season. Uh, looking back at some of the numbers, I mean, 119th out of 120 scoring offense, total offense, um, it's 116th in sacks allowed. I mean, it's a pretty well-rounded uh, set of statistics that were, were pretty bad, 105th in the red zone. Um, we mentioned earlier in the last segment, uh, maybe an admission, though, that things weren't going well, got rid of those co-offensive coordinators. Um, Talking about Bill Cuban a little more, what can he change about 
what we saw last year. Well, yeah, he brings kind of a pass-happy offense to, to Champaign. Uh, his teams at Western Michigan, where he coached was the head coach for the last eight seasons, really uh, relied on uh, wide receivers and quarterbacks making plays. Uh, you look back at Western Michigan's record books, and uh, three of the court, top quarterbacks in the school's history were there when Cubitt was either head coach or when he was offensive coordinator at Western Michigan in the, the late 90s. So uh, I think you're going to see the ball in, in the air a lot more. Uh, they want he, he wants Donovan Young and Josh Ferguson to be a lot more north-south running this year. I know Josh Ferguson's talked this uh, preseason about how last year the offense was doing a lot of east-west shifting even before the play. Yeah. Uh, so the running backs seem to be in favor of this offense a lot more because you just get the ball, you find the hole, and you hit it hard as you can. Um, but Bill Cubitt will throw the ball around. Uh, he showed that a lot in Rain Tool during the, the one public scrimmage they had. He threw short screen passes, he threw intermediate routes, he threw deep deep routes. So he's, he's not shy of putting the ball in the air. And Steve, I want to ask you just uh, last season, Nate Shieldhouse, his numbers went down again. I know he had the injury early in the season. Uh, concerns about his drop off last year? Well, he was hurt a lot. Yeah. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, he hurt that ankle in the first game, didn't play at Arizona State. That's when it all started to come apart. When you go out to, to the uh, desert there and get blown out on a Saturday night uh, with uh, Shieldhouse not playing, uh, he did pass for 361 yards, but uh, only four touchdowns. Riley O'Toole had twice that many touchdown passes in the backup role. So he's the key. He's a key. No doubt you were talking about the the pass happy. One thing that we saw at Camp Rantoul, I don't know if we'll see this in a game or not, but they, they backed the offense up to the three-yard line, had them come out, 97-yard touchdown right. pass. Will you see that in the game? I don't know, but it was, it was pretty fun to see it in practice anyway. Yeah, well, so the quarterback situation will be interesting to watch moving forward. Well, coming up next, we, we got a touch on the Big Ten. Kind of went from out of the picture a year ago to squarely in the mix for the national title. That happened quick, but of course, that had a lot to do with some probationary periods ending. We'll talk about it next on Inside the Illini Big Ten Football. Time again for the Inside the Illini Weekly MVP. No game tape to look at yet, but four weeks of camp to choose from. And right now, that goes to running back Donovan Young. The junior led the Illini rushing attack last season and appears to be ready to do that again. Young says he tacked on a few pounds and turned in the grittiest performance at the Camp Rantoul scrimmage. When I get tired, the defense doesn't have a rest because we got a, we got a beast in the backfield. When I'm not in there, and then when I'm in there, we're both beasting up. Welcome back to Inside the Illini here at Hickory River Smokehouse. It was a consensus down year in the Big Ten last year. Wisconsin went to the Rose Bowl with a 7-6 and six record, less than impressive for them. But now that the Buckeyes are off their probationary period, they're squarely in the hunt for a national title, and things just got a whole lot more interesting. WAND's Noah Newman gives us a look at the leaders' division. In the leaders' division, the road to Indianapolis will likely go through Columbus. Ohio State enters the season as the heavy favorite. Heisman hopeful Braxton Miller is a big reason why. We gotta just be the same way we was last year. Take one game at a time. You know, uh, don't overlook no type of opponent that's, you know, that's ranked lower than you. Miller's one of nine starters back on offense, a group that led the Big Ten in scoring last year. So they'll put up points, but can they stop people? Only four starters return on D. Defense is where the issues are. We lost our entire front seven. I believe we recruited well. Uh, Mike Vrabel has done a very good job developing a little bit of a spree de corps with our defensive line. Urban Meyer's former assistant Gary Anderson enters his first season as the head coach at Wisconsin, taking over a program that's been to the Rose Bowl five times since 1998. Uh, trust is a big thing with us. We talked about it day one, and I think after six and a half months, we've uh, got trust within players to coaches and coaches to players. The Badgers could challenge the Buckeyes, as could Penn State coming off an 8-4 and four season in Bill O'Brien's first year. But depth could be their Achilles heel. Because of NCAA sanctions and heavy graduation, the Nittany Lions entered the season with only 65 players on scholarship. The Purdue Boilermakers returned nine starters on offense and five on defense. First-year head coach Daryl Hazel says it's time to put this program back on the map. It's going to take a lot of work, but we're going to climb ourselves out of the middle. And we're going to put this program on national prominence for a long po point in time. Purdue's rivals to the south could actually be the real sleeper in this division. Indiana has 19 starters back, but they'll need to tighten up a defense that allowed a league-worst 35 points per game last season. And then there's the Illini, picked by most to finish dead last. Consider it good bulletin board material for the upcoming season. It's kind of a motivation factor for us to really come out there and really display our talents and display the hard work we have. 
Well, guys, a few topics in the leaders division, but all the that anybody really wanted to talk about at media today was Ohio State. Our friend Bob Osmussen giving them some love in the AP <laughs> poll and now taking some heat for it. Yeah, they, he, Bob was the uh, only one to give Ohio State a uh, first place vote. Uh, Alabama got 58 of the 60, Georgia got one, but uh, Ohio State is uh, definitely the favorite in the leaders division. Uh, they were a big popular topic at uh, media days in Chicago in July, uh, just with all the off the field transgressions that Urban Myers had to deal with, but also right. Braxton Miller, uh, Heisman candidate at quarterback, so uh, and coming off an undefeated season like they did last year, uh, the expectations are always high in Columbus, but they're even more so this year. Is Ohio State the team to unseat the SEC? Ooh, that's a good question. I think uh, as far as the Big Ten goes, they would be the, the favorite to do that. Right. Can they do it? That's another question. I, the SEC's on some kind of roll here that I, right. I just haven't seen for a long time, but Ohio State's got that kind of SEC team. You know, they've got a little right. better speed at the skill positions. They've got a great quarterback. Can they do it? I don't know, but uh, it'll be fun to watch. But I, certainly they're the favorite in the Big Ten. You seem to ask Urban Meyer that question, and he would probably tell you no. He's the mo biggest critic of his own team. Right. But uh, you have Urban Meyer there, a guy who's won national championships with SEC teams. Uh, he kind of got this role started for them. So I think uh, he's a guy that people would have a lot of trust in. Now, I also want to talk about Wisconsin. Interesting development there, a guy who talked his share of smack about the SEC. Brett Bielema is now there. Uh, Gary Anderson comes from Utah State. Have we learned much about him? I know he comes from the Mountain West. Uh, Mountain West kind of offense is maybe a little little bit more trickery involved in there. Well. I think he'll kind of keep the same approach that Wisconsin's yeah. built its uh, foundation on. Uh, a run first attack. They got a, a great two running backs coming back and uh, James White and, and Melvin Gordon and uh, that Wisconsin, you know, they'll still pound and ground in, on the ground game and uh, throw the ball when need be. I think the interesting thing with Wisconsin is seeing who emerges uh, as their quarterback. They kind of had a three-man race uh, throughout spring and into the fall. So uh, who kind of steps up and, and kind of takes that role will be, uh, be something to watch with the Badgers this year. Gary Anderson's boss is still Barry Alvarez. <laughs> right. so I think the, the style of football probably won't change much in right. Madison, but it, it could a uh, little bit. And I think Matt Wright, the quarterback question, uh, which – will be answered uh, later today when they get into action uh, will be uh, one of their keys there. Hey, you mentioned the, the other running backs. Monte Ball is gone, but the other two guys combined for like 1,400 yards, 15 touchdowns. They're fast. I think they're, <laughs> they're, I think they're, they're going to be okay there. <laughs> yes. And while we got time, and our apologies to Indiana and Purdue, but we do need to talk about Penn State a little bit. Coming off the season they had, I think people may not have been terribly surprised. I think we'd be more surprised if they did as well as those scholarships start dwindling uh, going forward here. Well, with Ohio State on probation last year, I thought Penn State was the best story of, of the Big Ten, really. Right how they handled that and yes they've got fewer numbers but uh, they seem to have everybody bought in yeah i agree bill, bill o'brien uh has talked talked about it uh, in chicago in july and, and the players did as well just how there's not that distraction there's not that cloud kind of hanging over the program this year that also helped too that ohio state was going through some legal issues of its own so right. the, the focus really wasn't on penn state as much as it was last year but uh yeah i don't think we'll see that drop off yet with the nittany lines maybe in a two, three years or so, but but right now it's Penn, Penn State's looking okay. Yeah, I don't think you can say enough about the job Bill O'Brien did last year and, and really inspiring that team to rise up when, when everything went wrong for a team that had nothing to do with the team for a problem there. Yeah. Well, uh, Legends Division, if I recall, was a three-team race until the last couple of weeks there. Uh, we'll see if that might happen again this year as we roll on inside the Illini Big Ten football. Welcome back. Ohio State may be a consensus pick in the leaders division, but it's far more wide open up top in the legends. We have Michigan, Nebraska, and Northwestern within six spots of each other in both major polls, and that should make for an interesting season as we take a look at the legends division. The legends division is wide open, but if there is a favorite, it's probably Michigan. Brady Hoke enters his third season at the helm. Denard Robinson's not walking through that door but Devin Gardner and Fitzgerald Toussaint are. If anyone can stop those two, it's Michigan State. The Spartans defense ranked fourth in the nation last year, so how in the world did they lose six games? Well, five of those losses were by a combined total of 13 points. On offense, stud running back Le'Veon Bell is now with the Steelers, but Mark D'Antonio's had good things to say about his replacements. I thought our running backs looked good. I thought Bula looked good. 
Hill, Langford. I thought the two freshmen, uh, uh, Delton Williams and, and Gerald Holmes, looked good as well. Nebraska will try to bounce back from that embarrassing loss to Wisconsin in the conference championship game. Taylor Martinez will certainly help. 20, 15, Taylor skips away from it. The dual threat QB rushed for over 1,000 yards in 2012. And the Wildcats have finally done it. Expectations are very high in Evanston, where Northwestern's coming off one of their best seasons of all time. Uh, to be off the heels of uh, you know our longest bowl streak in modern time uh, of one uh, bowl successful season, uh, and to have the number of young men that we have coming back in 15 from a starting standpoint gives us great confidence that we'll hopefully be able to take the next step. Minnesota and Iowa fly in under the radar. The Gophers will look to build on last year's six and six record. They return nine starters on offense. And for the Hawkeyes, there's really nowhere to go but up. They lost their final six games last year to finish four and eight, their worst record since 2000. If they don't turn it around this fall, Kirk Ferentz will be on the hot seat in Iowa City. The one thing I have learned through the years, you know, a lot of people offer up observations. It's better probably to focus on solutions. At least I'm, from my end, that's what I need to be worried about. I got all kinds of people giving me observations. So we just got to worry, try to focus on what we can do to get better. All right, guys, let's uh, give Nebraska their due. Won the division last year. Start at the top there. Taylor Martinez is still a quarterback. He's, he seems he's been there for 10, 15 years almost. Yeah, uh, seems like He's set, set a lot of records there, throwing and, and running the ball. Uh, the offense is a big uh, big focal point for, for the Cornhuskers this year. Defense is kind of a concern. Uh, last year they gave up a bunch of points, particularly in the, the Big Ten uh, title game to Wisconsin. Uh, I know Brett Bielma is probably reminded of that daily. Um, but yeah, the, the black shirts weren't real stout last year, so uh, watching how the defense develops uh, this year in Lincoln will be kind of the, the key focal point with them. Yeah, I don't think they'll have a problem scoring. Don't think so, but uh, if, if they have a problem defensively, there's nothing uh, that gets the uh, Nebraska folks more riled up than giving up a lot of points, and uh, they probably are one of those fan bases with a short fuse, so right. Bo Pelini catching a little bit of heat on the defensive side of the ball, and he being a defensive guy himself from his playing days, I'm sure he's focused on that. He talked about it quite a bit in Chicago, and I look for them to be a little better defensively. Can they win that division? Yes, they can. Will they? It's good. As you mentioned earlier, it's going to be tighter on that side. I think. One more wide open. Illinois gets that first week of the Big Ten exactly. season. Exactly. So on the road. We'll be in Lincoln. We'll see how that one goes, but we'll leave that for a few weeks from now. Uh, Michigan coming back, losing Denard Robinson, but they got a new guy at quarterback. Uh, talk about some of the changes you might see for Michigan's yeah, offense. Devin Gardner will assume the helm this year for to replace Denard Robinson. Uh, I think Brady Hoke's going to go to more of a, a pro-style offense this year with the traditional kind of two running backs, two wide receivers set up. You won't see Devin Gardner rushing for 150, 200 yards every week. If he does, I'm sure Brady Hoke would like that, but uh, he can do more with his arm. Uh, he started uh, about five games last year for Michigan so he, he's got some experience back and, and he's definitely a, a player that uh, Brady Hoke's expecting big things out of this year. Denard Robinson one of those other guys that it seems like they've been around forever and <laughs> right. he's finally gone now and you know you talk about the change in offensive philosophy perhaps you started to see that late in the season mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. they inserted Gardner in and, and uh, tried to utilize uh, Robinson in another way, so maybe that was the indicator of what was to come, and also probably tried to expose Robinson a little bit uh, for his next level, if there is one for him in, in pro football, but uh, Michigan's Michigan. They're always going to be right in it. Uh, Northwestern's another team we have to talk about. The game we saw against Illinois was a uh, five-touchdown game, but that wasn't, you know, Northwestern won 10 games last year, but that wasn't necessarily indicative, that game against Illinois, of how they won the rest of their games. Are they a contender this year? Oh, I believe so. Pat Fitzgerald's got the, the Wildcats humming along. He, he's definitely uh, the right man for the job right now. Uh, King Coulter's back, uh, an athletic quarterback who can run the ball, uh, throw the ball, catch the ball if need be. Uh, Venrick Marks, another uh, key can, key returner for them, not only returning kicks but also uh, running out of the backfield. Uh, Northwestern is, is up there. They're, they're not the Northwestern uh, of old at all. They're, they're going to contend, and I think they will be in it till the end. In, in the and they finally season. won a bowl game, so they got that to build on. <laughs> That's right. All right. Hey, coming up next season hasn't technically started yet, so we don't have any stats to look at or big plays, but we're going to get a chance to look at some of the more intriguing players, specifically one, as we turn our spotlight on a single player on the Illinois football team. That's next on Inside the Illini, Big Ten Football.
Welcome back to Hickory River Smokehouse here in Urbana. Time for the Inside the Illini Spotlight today, focusing on a player that probably seemed not more than a name on a list back in the spring for a team that lacked depth, especially in the wide receiver position. They reached for some junior college transfers. A guy that's really intrigued us during camp is Martez Barr. I guess like you can just say I like to make big plays. I guess that's how I like to describe myself, just a big play player. Whether or not he's the go-to guy on this Illinois offense, he wants the ball, and he'll let you know about it. Yeah, I talk a little bit. I talk a little bit. Martez Barr is being called the fastest learner on the Illinois offense. A learning curve offensive coordinator Bill Cuban admits appeared to be pretty steep for the 20-year-old receiver this spring. I really thought that he struggled. He, uh, he did not look very good. I, I thought he was uh, he had some bad habits. When he came in uh, this spring, he, he was just like uh, what a freshman would be as far as learning stuff and, and getting things going. A Washington, D.C. native, Barr was recruited to New Mexico, where he played receiver and defensive back for the Lobos. Recruited by fellow D.C. native and former Illini coordinator Mike Loxley. He spent last season at Iowa Western Community College. That probably means little to the folks in Champaign-Urbana, but in the junior college world, they're a power, winning last season's national championship. You know, I played on the Division One level, played some Duco ball, um, you know, so he understands things well. In terms of uh, uh, discipline, even route running and stuff like that, and that guy has really made himself in a pretty good player. To add to that intrigue, Barr has factored heavily in camp. Big plays as a deep target or used underneath and finding yards with his leg. I don't know what Coach Cuban got planned for, but uh, you might see him in the inside a little bit. In his offense, I might end up anywhere. I might be at a running back, tight end. Anywhere. He may be new, but Barr started learning the new playbook in the spring, just like everyone else. And like I said, he's a fast learner. All right, guys, I think we've got limited opportunities to talk to Barr throughout the camp season. Uh, from what I can tell, a pretty confident guy. Uh, at least he believes that he can be a big playmaker in this offense. How much do we believe that at this point? Well, he, he comes from a, a proven junior college program in, in Iowa right. Western Community College where he helped uh, them win a national title last uh, last fall. Uh, originally went to New Mexico out of high school, uh, a Mike Loxley recruit, a uh, former Illinois offensive coordinator when he was the head coach at New Mexico. Uh, I think he's a guy that can kind of go over the middle uh, and catch some passes and be kind of that dependable uh, guy kind of in the slot. He can also he also showed during camp as well that he can he can catch the, long, the deep ball as well. So uh, he, he's definitely an intriguing uh, wide receiver on a, an offense that needs some playmakers. He seemed to factor in a lot of the plays during camp. He did, and he seems to have a, a confident air about him where he likes to talk a little bit, and that's that's, that's okay. That's great. He, they list him at six foot one ninety. He looks a little bit bigger than that. Uh, with me, we'll see actually as we move along if if those uh, measurements change any. But he, he seems to be a physical guy. I asked Nathan Shieldhouse this week, does he have a favorite receiver? Has anybody stepped up to be the quote go-to guy? I'm not sure what the answer means because he said, well, not really. But is that good news or bad news? You know, maybe he's got three or four guys that would fall into that role. Ryan Langford certainly would be in the conversation. Right. But I think Barr is a guy that could uh, move into that conversation as well. I think that is an important thing to know because if you're a, you're a guy who had a more reliable receiver than others and Ryan Langford, you might tend to say his name. The fact that he didn't may say a little bit about, about Barr. Now, he does come from a junior college, was productive there in his time there, but he was recruited as a D-run recruit like we mentioned. So he's not just some junior college scrub kind of thrown into the mix here. Yeah, no, he, he definitely had his list of offers coming out of high school, uh, coming from Washington, D.C. He, he's well-traveled, to say the least, so right. I don't think he'll have any trouble adapting to uh, Champaign-Urbana at all, but he, he's definitely a, a player that Bill Cubitt likes to see, and I know Mike Bellamy's talked about him some this fall, too, just kind of how he can he can kind of jumpstart the offense and kind of be that, that guy that most people might not have heard of to start the year, but towards the as the season progresses, he, he could stand out. I don't know, Coach Cubitt has kind of said he's still raw, he's got a few things to learn, but when I was talking to Nate Shieldhouse during the camp season, he said he was about the quickest to learn, that he came in basically as a freshman, learning the coaches, learning the system, and he was the fastest learner, and he was the first one I noticed whose stripe was removed in the fall camp, so it'll be interesting to watch him this season. Well, you know, we're in week four of the NFL preseason, or we're getting close to week four here. A week from tomorrow will be the first full slate of NFL games. A bunch of Illini factoring in there, including some that graduated recently. Here's our first installment of Illini and the Pros. Illini and the Pros is brought to you by O'Brien Auto Park of Urbana. A down year really didn't have much effect on the NFL draft weekend or the signing period that followed. Pro teams picked off a number of Illini 
especially on defense. Michael Buchanan to the Patriots, Terry Hawthorne to the Steelers, Hakeem Spence to the Buccaneers. Among those trending upward, Spence, who leads the Bucks this preseason with six tackles, four for a loss. Buchanan, who's out playing young players at Patriots camp, even leapfrogging a few into what appears to be a roster spot. And Glenn Foster, who the Times Picayune called the breakout rookie of the preseason for the New Orleans Saints. He's not just in line for a job, he's a legitimate competitor for a starting position, says head coach Sean Payton. Probably my own coaches didn't know how athletic I was, you know, but um, I was able to turn some heads. The Illini highlight of the preseason goes to Saints running back Pierre Thomas a 51-yard catch and run for a touchdown in week three. Find the end zone, Pierre Thomas. Rashard Mendenhall and Mikel LaShore are hoping for better fortunes in 2013. LaShore, still with the Lions, is back from a torn ACL that forced him to miss all of last season. It appears to have bumped his name off the Detroit too deep. Mendenhall, now a part of the Arizona Cardinals backfield, is suffering from a knee sprain, but is expected to play in Arizona's opener. Not as lucky for Aurelius Ben. The Eagles receiver tore his ACL and he'll miss the season. But the biggest piece of Illini related news this preseason was capped a bust for bust trade, sending former first round pick AJ Jenkins to Kansas City. Jenkins had the hype of a first rounder in San Francisco, just not the results. No catches, no yards, targeted just once. He'll likely get a shot to be a part of the Chiefs receiving core it will need a big season to earn back some of that first-rounder respect. Welcome back to Inside the Illini. Steering away from the Illini for a segment to bring you uh, Eastern Illinois, something that the Eastern Illinois Communications Department has provided us with for the past year. We absolutely love it. Their Panthers have some pretty high expectations coming off an OVC championship, picked to repeat as champions, a couple of preseason consensus All-Americans. We take our first look inside the Panthers with Eastern Illinois University. From worst to first, that's what Dino Babers did in his first season as Panther football head coach. EIU's 2012 OVC championship was the Panthers' fourth in the past eight seasons. Babers' up-tempo offense that he brought with him from Baylor set numerous team and individual marks. In nine of EIU's 12 games, the Panthers put up 30 or more points. Add returning Walter Payton Award finalists Jimmy Garoppolo and Eric Laura to the 2013 equation, and the Panthers' expectations are as high as they've ever been. Obviously, it's a little bit different than being picked last and, and sneaking up on some people and winning the conference. And now we're out, we're out front. Everybody's got it circled on their uh, calendar, so to speak, and then their schedules. And uh, it's going to be a, a difficult, challenging, but hopefully rewarding year. Pressure's going to be there regardless. We, we put a bunch of pressure on ourselves, and the coaching staff puts it on us. So, I mean, we can't think about the outside sources putting it on us and whatnot. We just got to go out there and play our game, and we'll be fine. Garoppolo and Laura have earned numerous OVC and national preseason accolades for the upcoming 2013 season. The two seniors want to do a lot more than put up video game-like numbers for a second season in a row. I would say probably 15, as in wins for the, you know, for the team. Uh, you know, catches aren't really on my mind as of right now. Um, my role on the team, you know, it'll take, partake its own role uh, through the offense. Um, you know, a personal number I thought of was to be back in triple digits again, so 100 is, is a nice set mark or whatnot, but not really worried about that at this time. I don't look too far into it. I mean, that stuff is it's going to be there. It's all preseason stuff, so I mean, it doesn't mean too much to me right now. It's, it's the stuff that after the season, hopefully I'll look back and have enough accolades and stuff like that to be happy with. And, I mean, if, if we get wins and stuff like that and make a run into the playoffs, we'll be all right and that, all that stuff will fall into place. Yeah, you starts the season with a challenging non-conference schedule, three of four games away from O'Brien Field. The opener is at San Diego State, a BCS school from the Mountain West Conference. Their season last year was, in some notes, maybe even better than the season we had last year. And I believe they've lost, oh, four or five players. They got 17 to 16 starters returning. This is going to be one heck of a contest, and you're playing a very, very veteran football team that's used to winning. The Panthers and Aztecs have met before. Twelve years ago, Tony Romo was at quarterback as EIU fell to SDSU in the only previous meeting. Kickoff tonight is at 7 p.m. from San Diego. The game can be viewed online at dmwc.com, the Mountain West Conference's online site. 
Reporting on the Eastern Illinois Panthers for Inside the Illini, I'm Brad Kupiak for WEIU-TV. Eastern Illinois plays San Diego State tonight at 5 o'clock local time in San Diego. That's 7 o'clock Central Time. We'll keep an eye on it. Next, bringing back the Pickums, but changing the rules a little bit. We'll explain next on Inside the Illini Big Ten Football. Welcome back to Inside the Illini. I got the full table here now for our pickums. Each week we'll be making picks of college football games across the country, a few Big Tens, some of the bigger, bigger ticket games, and there are usually a couple here in week one. Now we've changed the rules from last season. Last year we picked our own game to level the playing field a bit. We're each going to pick the same three games, and uh, our three games coming up here in week one, LSU versus TCU, that one at Cowboys Stadium or whatever they're calling it now, Georgia against Clemson, and Boise State versus Washington. Let's start with that one. Washington's a team we're going to see here in a couple of weeks. Uh, let's hear your pick next. I'm, I'm going to go with the Huskies at, at home in a renovated stadium uh, to, to take down Chris Peterson's Broncos. All right. I'm going to agree because uh, I know where you're going on this. <laughs> uh, I'll be the uh, tiebreaker perhaps uh, on this. I'm going to go with Washington as well. I think playing at home gives them a little bit of an edge. Boise might turn out to be a better team in the long run, but in that first game, I'm going to go with the Huskies. It's hard to discount that emotional factor coming in when your when your uh, stadiums reopen. But you know, I went to Washington State. We're supposed to hate the Huskies, but but I did cover Boise State for a while as well. That team, I'll tell you what, when Chris Peterson has nine months to prepare for a team, he's darn good. And so I'm going to go with that as my reason. I'm going uh, Boise State over Washington. All right, LSU. TCU, number 12 LSU, number 20 TCU, Matt Gill. Uh, I'm going to go with LSU. Uh, like the Tigers in that uh, neutral site matchup. T it should be a good game, I feel, but uh, LSU has a lot to prove, and uh, th this game will start them towards the, the treacherous SEC schedule. hope we're not developing a trend here, but uh, I'm going to go with uh, LSU as well. We, we just, collaborated before. Yeah, I just think the SEC is too strong, and uh, I think they're really good, and they'll win that game. I'm going to go LSU as well, and uh, I'll keep it at that. We'll all agree there. Let's see this one, though. I think we might get some disagreements because number five, Georgia, against number eight, Clemson. Clemson, the home team in this one, favored by a couple of points. What do you see in this game? I'm going to go with Clemson. Uh, I think playing in Death Valley is, is a good advantage to have. Uh, they got Taj Boyd back at quarterback, got uh, Sammy Watkins back at wide receiver. So uh, I'm liking the Tigers. I think that's a good pick, but uh, I'm going to go with Georgia there just to do something different. <laughs> I think uh, they'll be up to the task to playing on the road there. I think that'd be a great game. What a what a great game to have right out of the gate. Right. Two top ten teams. Yeah, absolutely. That'll be a big one. My pick, and it's because the Bulldogs just have probably one of the best SEC offenses we might ever see. Aaron Murray's going to break all sorts of records there. I got to see him play against Boise State there a couple of years ago, and man, he was good. Boise State was able to pull out that game, but I got to go with Georgia. I think they're going to be a contender in the SEC this year, uh, maybe maybe the top team to unseat Alabama if there is one to do it. I, I hardly think anybody can in any division, but I think that's what we'll see. So there we go. We have a little bit of dissension, which is exactly <laughs> what we want. We'll see how those picks go throughout the season. We'll tally them up. Whoever's the winner is the winner. All right, uh, coming up next, really the segment we're here for, talking some SIU football, the Illini kick on Southern Illinois in minutes. We'll talk about that next on Inside the Illini, Big Ten Football. Welcome back for the final segment here today on Inside the Illini Big Ten Football. It by no means is Michigan-Ohio State, but there is some in-state pride on the line here today, Illinois versus Southern Illinois. The Salukis come to town a, a season where they were smack dab in the middle of the Missouri Valley Conference, but it's a must-win for the Illini. We take a look at the Salukis. It's a hot day for a ball game. Well, I'm worried about this heat in, in his room <laughs> right now. The Illini and Salukis are staring down highs in the mid-90s. In other words, in about the fourth quarter, Mother Nature is going to be kicking their butts. You would have rather have it, you know, come this week and not you know, just showing up on Saturday because that would have been, you know, a whole lot more difficult to deal with. A battle of endurance for both sides and an in-state rivalry renewed. The Illini are 3-0 in the history of the series last beating SIU 35-3 in 2010. But new casts of characters for each, and SIU will be bringing some talent to Champaign. They're a real mature team. Uh, they're returning four, four starters on the O-line. 
So these guys, they're, they're not, they're not a, a kick around type of bunch. Looking forward to playing those guys. They are always competitive. In their league, they're you know one of the top teams in their league. The Salukis are stockpiling running back transfers. Malcolm Agnew from Oregon State this year to go with Iowa transfer Mikhail McCall, who had nine touchdowns last season. By contrast, Illinois had six rushing touchdowns that weren't by quarterbacks. We know that uh, you've got to have your game ready, and uh, your game's got to be ready on Saturday because we're going to get everything they've got. From the outside, we'll see a 6-5 and five team that finished fifth in its own FCS-level conference. The Illini just see a team that got a whole lot better in the offseason. Saturday's going to be a big day for, for, uh, for the team. And it's, it's going to be a, a true testament of how hard we work and, and how we focus on the little things and, and how we put last year behind us. So, um, so I'm excited. Well, guys, one of those games that are on a lot of Big Ten schedules, the FCS team, the punching bag, most would hope. Illinois has to win this, but they don't just have to win it. They have to win it by a lot. That's about the only outcome I can see where fans come out satisfied today. Yeah, no, it, exactly. This isn't, you know, a marquee matchup or anything. You're not going to get the big uh, TV talent to uh, head to Champaign uh, in a few minutes. But uh, th this is the only game that I think Illinois fans can confidently say going into this year that Illinois is favored to win, and, and they should. I mean, they, they haven't lost to an FCS team. They've played one every year since 2006. They've always done well against those. Those are always the, the guaranteed games. I know uh, Southern will come in with a little chip on their shoulder. Their FCS in-state schools always want to, you know, try to show up the state school. But uh, Illinois is definitely the overwhelming favorite going into today. We don't think it's going to happen, Steve. But what would happen if Illinois lost this game? Well, that'd be tough. And I think this this borders on a no-win situation for right. the Illini and teams around the country that play games like this. I like the fact that they're keeping it in-state. They're playing uh, teams from within the uh, state boundaries. That's nice. The more you put yourself out there, you know, a, a loss to somebody like Louisiana Tech that happened last year doesn't hurt quite as much as, as this might if right. it would happen. They've played three times previous, one close game, a couple of blowouts. Close game was a three-point game back in 85. Of course, everybody remembers the 1990 game, Howard Griffith with eight touchdowns in that game against the Salukis, who led early in that ball game before losing 56-21. We were bored. No, I'm just kidding. I was four. I, <laughs> and I covered the game. Thank you very much. But I do remember it uh, very well. But uh, Southern will come in, as you mentioned, with a chip on their shoulder, and uh, it would be the biggest win in their history if they could pull it off. I would think so. Well, let's talk a little bit about the Salukis. I mean, we I think we all think this game's more about Illinois and what they do. But Southern does bring probably a little bit better team than they had last year. Right? Yeah, they went 6-5 and five last year in an always uh, tough Missouri Valley football conference. Uh, North Dakota State was the FCS uh, national champion the last two years and they play SAU every year and uh, got some running backs to watch out for, some transfers uh, that, that FCS programs always get. The quarterback's coming back. Uh, he's more of a game manager though than uh, he almost in kind of like Nathan Shieldhouse has been in the past but uh, the Salukis definitely have some uh, weapons on offense. I don't know defensively if they can stop Illinois especially if uh, Bill Cubitt's system's operating the way he wants it to. Uh, so it'll be interesting to, to see how the first half unfolds with, with if, if SIU can keep this a competitive game uh, going into the second half. See? SIU has three junior college transfer running backs and they feel pretty good about uh, that position in the depth and so does Illinois with Donovan Young and Josh Ferguson but I had a couple people in uh, Carbondale say they feel like they have an advantage in the backfield which is confident. Right. <laughs> That's one, one thing that. you can say about it. Yes, right. Yeah. You should say that, but I don't know if it's true. Right. We'll find out about that because Donovan Young's a pretty good Big Ten back. Yeah, I don't know if we believe that as well. Donovan Young and Josh Ferguson, I think we all liked what we've seen out of Young so far. If, if there's a strength on that offense, it'll be running backs. All right, guys, um, let's talk about Illinois. To 2013 season outlook. I mean, I. You've, you've talked, we've talked off camera about what, what you think their record is going to be. What's the ceiling for this team? Is there a possibility of a bowl game? Or well, is that scheduled to uh, I'm going to take the always optimistic approach that Bob Osmussen takes. Uh, Illinois. 12 and no, not, not 12 <laughs> no, but Illinois uh, has only finished 2 and 10 one other time in program history. The following season, they went to the Rose Bowl. I'm not suggesting that you should buy 
plane tickets for Pasadena right now. But it'd be a nice it, vacation. It January. would be a nice vacation. <laughs> but I think the big thing that people want to see out of Illinois, the fans, the players, the coaches, is they just want to be more competitive this year. Last year, a lot of games was over by halftime. The, the fan base wasn't interested in what was going on. So they, they need to put a better product on the field this year. Um, SIU game is the first start of that. I think the big game for them this season uh, is week two uh, against Cincinnati. I think if you can pull an upset of the Bearcats or, or at least you know keep it close, that, that should generate a lot of interest uh, moving forward. One positive that I could find in covering Illinois as long as I have, in years when they've been turned out pretty good, you didn't necessarily see it coming. <laughs> so maybe this is a surprise team. Would with four wins, which would be double what they had last year, would, would that uh, get the fan base excited? I don't know. It would show some progress, and I think they've got to at least do that and, as Matt said, be competitive in these games. And uh, I think the quarterback battle, and not that there's a battle right now, but I think the quarterback situation will be interesting to watch. Do the Illini get ready for the next four years, three years? We'll see how that goes. Well, hey, that does it for us on our first edition of Inside the Illini here in the 2013 season. Thanks to Hickory River Smokehouse in Urbana. We'll be here every week for all the games throughout the year. For now, for Steve.